if you're good, people will refer business to you all the time by being ethical, by being honest, by being hardworking, by being an expert. Hello and welcome to episode 40 of the Smart Agents Podcast. My name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. In today's episode, we have the honor of being joined by the first lady of Beverly Hills Real Estate, Myra Normand. With decades of experience selling homes in one of the most exclusive areas in the country, Myra shares her story of success. As one of Los Angeles' last family-owned brokerages, Normand & Associates prides itself on deep community relationships and exceptional service. Now, before we get into the day's featured interview, make sure you follow and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. You can find us on all major podcasting platforms from Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and the list goes on. Also, as you can see if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Click the bell to get notifications when each new episode is uploaded. And lastly, if you or somebody else on your team has an awesome story or tip to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, on to the day's featured interview with Myra Normand. I really enjoyed our conversation and I hope you do as well. Really, the way I like to get everything started is if you can just tell me a little bit about yourself, how you, um, where you are in the country and a little bit about your business. Okay, well, I'm in Beverly Hills, California, a wonderful place to be. I've been here for decades. Um, my personal background is I was born in Germany and came, here, came to the United States as a very young girl, a little girl, two and a half years old, uh, re- raised in New Jersey and in Buffalo, New York, went to the University of Buffalo, um, A little bit more detailed about my background. My parents were Holocaust survivors, and I was born in a DP camp. So I started out my life with a very deep and poignant background um, with loving family, but tiny because there were no grandparents and everybody had been killed in the war. So um, my work ethic started at a very young age. Uh, I saw how my father and my mother worked, and um, I had a little bit of tragedy. My dad died in front of me on Thanksgiving Day in the car, had a massive heart attack in his 40s, and I became the adult to my mom, who was 31, who had survived Auschwitz and came to United States to start a new life, and this out of nowhere happened. So I became the parent to my mom. I wanted to protect her and uh, we moved around a lot. And my mom was fortunate enough to meet the man who raised me, Arnold. And uh, I went to school. I went to college. I went to the university. We moved to Buffalo, New York. And I went to the University of Buffalo. And that's where I met my husband at the very young age of 19 and got married at 21. And by the time I was 30, I had three kids and a stay-at-home mom, which I loved my job of stay-at-home mom. But going back to my teenage years, Mm -hmm. my dad had a furniture company and he sold sewing machines. And he took me with him on the weekends and after school. Now, remember, my father didn't speak English well, and he did speak Polish. And he opened up a store in a Polish neighborhood and he sold furniture on layaway plans and he sold sewing machines. And I was the prop when he would say, this is such an easy job. A child could do it. And I watched him. There were no computers in those days. There was a box where people signed and filled out an application to win a free sewing machine. That became my dad's database. And that's when he would start calling people from their name and phone number and go to door to door. When I was in college, I was getting married and I wanted a part-time job. So I saw an ad in the paper for selling cookware and uh, dishes and china on a layaway plan for girls who were engaged to be married, they would put away $50 a month. And by the time they were getting married, they had everything they wanted. I thought that's right up my alley. 
I did it. And it was called Lifetime Cookware. And without me knowing that much about it, I assumed that every day that I went out to two uh, interviews, I should sell two sets of cookware. I, of course, sold two sets of cookware every day, and I became the head salesperson for the area. And I did not know that everyone sold one set of cookware a month. I was selling 10 a week, and uh, I made a lot of money. And before that, when I was in high school, I was a telemarketer uh, selling fire alarm systems, except I was not allowed to use the word fire alarm. I offered people a free turkey or a pie cutter for an interview to talk about fire safety. And I set up these appointments for the salespeople who would go there. And I was obviously the most successful uh, telemarketer. So without ever thinking about real estate, it was not in my DNA. I love fashion. I love clothes. I graduated with a BA in sociology. I never thought about real estate. So we go to 1970. I get married. We drive cross country to California in five days. Can't wait to get jobs. Little did we know in 1970, it was not a good economy. My husband was a structural and civil engineer. They were laying off engineers left and right. He had no chance being a young 22-year-old guy with no work experience. Anyway, um, I walked into an employment agency and I said, I'd like a job. And they said, we like you. We don't want you to leave. We want you to be an employment counselor and get jobs for people who are unemployed. I said, you don't understand. I want a job. So they said, no, 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 no. You will be perfect. You're good on the phone. And so I said, okay. I went into this Nancy Nolan employment agency. I started working. And I told my husband, when I see a job that comes out that looks good, I'm going to make an appointment for me. They did not allow me to use my real name. I was Mary Hansen not Myra Normand. And after a few months, I saw a job that I thought was really interesting. I called as the employment counselor for this particular person, made an appointment, went on the job interview after work. They hired me. And then I said, I need to tell you, I'm not this woman. I'm Myra Normand, but I wanted to first let you meet me. They said, this is hysterical. Is there anything else you're not telling me? And I said, no, that's all I can tell you. So they hired me and I worked there and I was very successful. In the meantime, my husband was working as a civil engineer and decided that his parents who were in Iran said they want to move to the United States because they see an impending coup with the Shah of Iran and they don't want to be there. So my husband decided to take some real estate courses. He did, we didn't know anything about L.A. We didn't know Encino, Sherman Oaks, Beverly Hills. We were as green as they come and very young and hungry. So we went ahead and uh, my husband opened up Normand and Associates with six people on Little Santa Monica and Beverly Hills. And... Uh, he took classes. He started to hone his skills in real estate, learning about the area and what was happening and how to go ahead and be a successful real estate agent. Long story short, he's the only Persian speaking broker on the West Side. This is before the Persians came from Iran in 1978. Uh, he ended up becoming very successful because the revolution came. A lot of people who knew my father-in-law called my husband and he was selling three, four houses a week. They were coming with suitcases with money. He was then on the Phil Donahue show and they were saying, well, if we went to Iran, we couldn't buy real estate. Why are all these people coming here and buying real estate and inflating the prices? And my husband very succinctly said, nobody's putting a gun to their head. They're so happy to get these huge prices in these all cash deals. And uh, Norman started to grow. 
I was the stay-at-home mom. I was raising three kids, very involved in the community, with my kids, tap, ballet, piano, little league, soccer, water, everything that was involved in being a super mom. I had a T-shirt that said, if a woman's place is in the home, why am I always in the car? Because this is what I was doing. And as I was sitting with mothers, I would hear them say, I need a bigger house. I'm getting divorced. I, I'm moving out of the area. I want to change the schools. And I get on the phone and call my husband and I say, who do you have in your office who can handle this particular person? After a year or two of this, he said, Myra, get your license. This is ridiculous. People know you. They trust you. You would be amazing. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to work in my husband's business. It's a formula for the failure. He said, you would be just selling. I'll run the company. You just sell to your friends. He said, sell one house a week, a month, a year. I don't care, but get your feet wet. Reluctantly, I took the test. I decided, okay, I'm not going to argue about it. I'm going to get my license and I'll sell one house a year. The minute I got my license, I decided that I need to let people know what I can do other than being uh, in Little League or being involved with my kids. I took the database from the school roster and I started calling people and saying, hi, how are you? Let's get together for coffee. I want to tell you about what I'm doing today and maybe you can help me. Well, human nature, when you open up a dialogue like this that you want help, most people will say, sure, come on over. And I'd say, I have a little gift for you just for the time you're taking to meet with me. I did that. And after five meetings, I got a client from the school who said, you know what? I'm living in Westwood. I want to move to Beverly Hills. So my kids have the Beverly Hills school. I sold her house, sold her a house in Beverly Hills. It was a huge transaction. And I did two deals. And the broker who knew my husband said, Myra, you're going to run for the hills. This is not a, a business for somebody like you. You're too nice. You're too sensitive. You're too kind. You're going to be written eaten up by the sharks in this business. Anyway, today when I run into her, she said, boy, did I not nail you? <laughs> Anyhow, um, so those two houses were my beginning. And I said, you know what? This isn't rocket science. If you put your effort into this, there's a way to be successful. So from my background of selling uh, alarm systems by giving people a free gift. I notice when you go to a charity event, they put a little box or a bag and people kill for it at the end of the dinner. And it's usually not much and everybody wants a free gift. So I said, this is going to be my motto for everybody that meets with me for the holidays. I will give them something that's indicative of the holiday, either a pumpkin for Halloween or a turkey, or a chocolate, or a gift certificate. I was flooded with people who said, come on over. And that is how I started my business. Um, I didn't need a mentor because my husband was my rah-rah team who said, Myra, you sold me, you can sell the world, you are amazing. Your work ethic is so strong, you're going to nail it. And I did. And I started selling house after house. And um, the word got out. And uh, that is basically how my story evolved. Uh, I'm a very hard worker. I'm very organized. I'm very structured. And I'm self-motivated. Those are very important keys. <clears throat> of being a success in any business. But in this business, you're your own boss. You can go as far as you're willing to push. And uh, obviously, whatever I did, it worked. Right. And it's an easy fop formula. Right. Well, and you said, you you know, while you didn't have a mentor, you, you almost were your own mentor in all those right. years of, you know, the sales background. Because that's what so many people need is that 
training on how to how to make the sale and how to close the sale. And you were getting that all along. Through osmosis. And not only <laughs> that, um, this is a people business. This is not just an acre equals 43650 It's an emotional business. You are selling the most expensive commodity that these people own, a house, where they live. It's emotional. And it takes a lot of hand-holding because people are scared. They're nervous. Am I making the right decision? Am I buying at the right time? You need to be the expert. You need to show them that you will guide them in a very, very easy way for them to make the right decision. And now all my businesses repeat. I just closed a deal last week for $9 million with somebody I've sold seven houses to in 30 years. Every four or five years he moves (laughs) and he makes that call. And if you're good, people will refer business to you all the time by being ethical, by being honest, by being hardworking, by being an expert. Right. Right. And, you know, you mentioned earlier with LA being such a competitive market and talking about the sharks, but it really having that emotional connection with people cuts through all of that. You're yeah. going to, you're going to, you're going to make a mark on people by being genuine and really looking out for them. Exactly. And I have told people that when they wanted to buy a specific house, don't do it. And they said, I can't believe you're trying to talk me out of it. And many times I have said to them, listen, I'm going on record. This is not the house for you, but I cannot stand in your way. And they buy it. And within six months, they call me up and say, get me out of here. You were so right. I should have listened to you from now on. Whatever I buy, I will listen to your guidance. So it's not just about the commission. It's about the relationship. Right. Right. And, you know, talking about the growth and the, the maintaining of that business over these years and as, you know, uh, different, you know, different ways that the, that the business has evolved, uh, you know, with so many people doing things online and, you know, um, all of the, the shortcuts that people take. I really think that this, the, the time that you do spend with people uh, is so valuable. And I, I think that's, you know, probably was what has helped maintain your business and grow it over these years. Remember, I started before computers, before MLS, <laughs> before iPhones, before fax machines, before emails. I started with basic hard work and that honed my skills because today the world is very different. There were no cell phones. I had dimes in my pocketbook that I would have to go to pay phones to tell people if I was running late, if I was early or that's the world I lived in. And uh, the world today is very different. And the model of a lot of the young kids today is completely different than my model. My model is what's old is new again. I know people like to text and email. I like to present my own offers in person. It's much easier to look at an offer and say I'm not interested than going in person and talking to the seller and making that deal. And I've done it sometimes till one in the morning at their house till I got that signature. And um, a lot of the new kids today don't want to do that. It's much easier for them to, to just email an offer. And that's not always the right way to do it. Right. Well, in, especially in the type of clientele that you have, these very high dollar deals, that's the amount, the one-on-one time is, I think is, is so necessary in that type of a deal. It's, you're not going to be able to create that, you know, there's such a big uh, trust factor that needs to be there between. And a lot of these very wealthy, powerful people don't want to meet with the broker. Right. And I have to say, listen, I just want 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And after the 10 minutes, I'm out the door. And uh, they sometimes were like, okay, okay. She's so persistent. Okay, I'll give her 10 minutes and I get there. And after 10 minutes, he says, don't stop. Let me hear the rest of it. And I usually get through the deal and make it and make the uh, sale. Right. So, And, you know, kind of switching gears a little bit over to that, to the higher end and the luxury listings. Um, 
I think a lot of times newer agents, they see the TV shows and they see, you know, the, the reality TV. Right, exactly. <laughs> and they get these big dollar signs in their eyes and they don't understand what all goes behind it. Um, could you tell me a little bit about what, what's that piece of advice that you would give uh, to somebody as they're starting out, you know, trying to break into that niche? Okay, it's reality TV. It's scripted. It's not necessarily life in the big, big circle of selling high-end real estate. There's a lot of work put into it, and uh, they don't always talk about the uh, pitfalls. Mm -hmm. But um, I did write a book about eight, nine years ago called from homemaker to breadwinner, which is sort of autobiographical. Mm -hmm. And it talks about um, how I started. And it also says that there's a formula and it's a formula to success. It's a one night read. And when I started out, there was no handbook that says, okay, you got your license now. Now, how do you get started? That's what this book is about. And it's a very, very strong ethical way of doing business. And when I, about 10 years ago, I went on the road at CAR and I talked and I sold a lot of books. I got letters from single mothers and uh, people who are starting out and they found it extremely important to read and it helped them. So um, it's also about giving back. I'm at a point in my life now that my son, Michael, has become the president of the company. Mm -hmm. He has continued to grow Normand and Associates to 185 brokers, three offices, which started out with seven salespeople. Uh, we're in Hollywood, we're in Brentwood, we're in Beverly Hills, and uh, he does what I don't want to do. I don't want to be a manager. I want to sell to the people that I know, that I like. I get a lot of gratification. And that's my social sphere of life. And these clients have become dear friends of mine who have continued to refer their friends. And now I'm at a stage uh, of my life that my kids are now married, have kids of their own. And a lot of their friends who grew up in my kitchen are calling for advice and that is extremely gratifying to see them as doctors and lawyers and buying properties for three, four, five million. It, and that's how my life has evolved. Right. So. And, you know, thinking back to what you said about your childhood and how it was very, you know, it's just you and your traumatic. parents, very yeah, traumatic and very, you didn't have the extended family and the, no. and so having this family business, I'd imagine that's got to be very gratifying and very kind of full, you know, how everything just kind of came about. It's a revolving door because Everybody in this community knows one of the Normans. Mm -hmm. My daughter is a doctor. She handles, she's a pediatrician. She sees young parents. Michael is president of the company. And my son, Howard, is a Emmy-nominated graphic designer mm -hmm. who makes me look young and cool and hip with his cutting-edge uh, marketing. So it's really a collaboration of all of our family members, and it's very gratifying. Uh, people know that Normand is a family-owned business, and we try to create an environment and a culture that is warm and welcoming to new uh, licensees. We have an incredible, incredible training program and uh, a lot of our young licensees have become stars in the business because they have that backing. They get the knowledge and uh, they know that everybody is there to help each other. So. Right. And how gratifying is that to, have, to bring in those new people for yourself? You know, you, you started this out on your, you didn't have those mentors and you kind of started no, this out on no. your own to be, yeah. so to be able to kind of give these, uh, these new people a little bit of a leg up that maybe you didn't have when you first started. It's very gratifying because like I said, in life, you want to give back. You have reaped a lot of rewards financially, emotionally. You have become a important figure in the real estate world. Um, and it's nice to be able to share your knowledge 
all the bumps in the roads, all the disappointments, and all of the triumphs with young people today who are like a sponge who want to know, what do I do? What do I say? There have been people who've gone into my house, young licensees, sat in my kitchen to hear how to negotiate keeping a listing, closing a deal. And my door is always open in my house, in my office. They know that I am accessible and I'm there to help. Uh, going back a little bit to the, you know, the luxury listings. And I've talked to people in the past that, you know, maybe in uh, where I'm at in Florida that kind of deal with that, the higher end stuff as well. And we've talked about how different the, um, just the whole process is from the marketing, the expectations of the marketing, you know, when these people are, are trusting you to sell their home, it's a lot bigger process than just a couple of open houses that maybe, you know, some of the other. Right. Right. Well, right now we have experienced a very unusual year and a half right. pandemic with the coronavirus. So everything we did in marketing went out the window. Number one, no open houses, no brokers opens. We can't even do uh, a pamphlet or a brochure that we hand to somebody. We're not supposed to touch paper and hand it to somebody else. So we had to become creative. Okay. Up until the coronavirus hit and the pandemic started, there was a model of how to deal with high-end luxury sellers and high-end luxury buyers. But because our world changed and everybody was in it together, we had to find a creative way to go online and to sell properties um, where we still gave our clients attention, but in a whole different mode. And uh, right now, as we're doing this podcast, uh, a lot of the tools that we used to woo high-end luxury sellers sort of went out the window. And for a long time, people were not even advertising because we couldn't go and meet people. We couldn't make an appointment to be with anybody. We were all stuck at home. The floodgates have now opened up. I'm happy to say our business has exploded in the last six months. Now that everybody has been lucky enough to get vaccinated, things are opening up. Restaurants are opening up. More people are going out and looking at houses. And there's this pent up desire to buy. Interest rates are so low and inventory is low because people were very hesitant. And now the market is so hot and everything is in multiple offers. Uh, there was a house that came on the market for 8.8. Eight. It's an escrow at 9.6. A fixer. <laughs> so that's what's going on in the real estate world. And our job is to be a chameleon and to be able with what we are thrown at to evolve and to change with what has been given to us. Right. So that's different today. Right. And I saw on your, uh, the YouTube page, the, uh, the home tours that you do the video home tours, and those are beautiful. I mean, they're so well done. Is that something that kind of has evolved throughout this last year and a half, you know, as you yes. have we do, we do videos. Mm -hmm. I don't use naked women. <laughs> I don't use suggestive. I, I go by the old school. Mm -hmm. Let the house sell itself. Mm -hmm. I'm not the star. I am focusing on the home, the location, the amenities. I do. Uh, I have a wonderful photographer, professional photographer. I, I hire the best of the best to do the videos. I have a huge database because I've been in the business for so long. I do a MailChimp that goes out. I do Instagram. I do Facebook. I do all the, the, the today's uh, tools to get the information out to everybody to know that this house is coming on the market. This house is sold, what it's sold for, how long it was on the market, because knowledge is power. And I'm trying to share that information so people can make the right decision. If they buy a house, oh, I saw that and it sold for this much. So this is the value. And um, yes, that's what we're doing today. No open houses, no right. brokers opens by appointment. <laughs> 
Yeah. And uh, but it's working. I have to say it's working. Right. Well, before we wrap up, one of the things I like to ask people that have been in the business and have, you know, have seen the success that you have, what is that one thing, if you could go back and tell yourself as you were getting into the business, what is that one thing that you would maybe tell yourself to kind of prepare for, or get ready, you know, to, to help out? Learn the business. See every house you can see. Make a mental image of everything you've seen how big the lot was, how big the house was, its amenities, the location. Because if you're not an ex- an expert, information today is on the click of a button. You need to know more than your buyer. If your buyer says, what about this house, and you don't know about it, then you're not the expert, and he may not need you. You need to be important to him because you know what the houses are worth. He needs to rely on you. And in order for you to get started, learn your craft. Go see as many houses as you can. See, even if you don't have a buyer for that house, it's important to do an array of low-end, medium, high-end, what it was listed for, how long it was on the market, and what it sold for. These are important facts that need to be in your database. And again, because I started many, many decades ago, The tools of today are quite different. I didn't start out with a computer. I didn't start out with email. I didn't start out with a cell phone. So I had to put in the legwork of driving up and down every street to see if any sign was being put out. It's much easier today, but, you know, it's Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. There's no separation today between work and uh, pleasure and family time because everybody has an email, a text, a phone. So you have to be able to understand how fast life is moving and you have to be there to be able to move as quickly. Right. So it's a different world today. Right. And you touched on, you talked about your work ethic and that is something that, you know, in this business, it is, it's 24 seven, it's nonstop and you have to be prepared for it if you're going to be successful. And you have to find out when is that biological clock in you the sharpest. I'm a morning person. I'm up at six. The house is quiet. I'm going through the day that I'm going to have ahead of me. My appointments, who I'm going to see. I lay out all the information. I do my emails. I read my texts. I go on Instagram. I da 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 da. And by nine thirty ten, I'm in the office ready to rock and roll. Um, some people are night people. They're in a fog during the day and they are much more productive in the evening. And so you find that clock in you where you're the sharpest and the most productive and you work with that. And that's going to guide you as well. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to talk with us today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And I hope that the viewers get a little bit out of this. And again, It's my pleasure to give back and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I really want to thank Myra for joining us today. And I really do appreciate her desire to give back to the real estate community. If you want to check out her book from homemaker to breadwinner, I've included a link in the episode description. So once again, if you think you or somebody else on your team has an awesome story or tip to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, but remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.